Um, but in any event, um, really here, today's speakers have been really nice and re a good tee up day with uh, just the regulatory environment and uh, with Eric and I think it was Lisa the, from Russell Investments and just teeing up the, the whole investment strategy and looking at your balance sheet, looking at your financial plan, which is a nice tee up because that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So, um, oh, here it is. So, so essentially today what I, I really want to describe and and uh, kind of get through is really, you know, learn how to incorporate kind of your financial planning into your strategic plan. So how many here actually have a living, breathing strategic plan? You look at it every day, quarterly. Not too many hands. Okay, well, you need to have that first in order to do the financial plan, right? So, um, but in any event, um, the strategic financial planning process is really it's really a support mechanism for the strategic plan because you can have all these great ideas and all these initiatives and objectives to, to uh, meet your goals and so forth. And your, you know, your strategic plan is typically five years. You want to build a new hospital five years from now or 10 years from now. And it's like, how are you going to get there? If you don't have a roadmap or some kind of a plan to get there, then you're going to be, it's going to be a much more challenging. So you need to have some measurable steps and be deliberate in the way that you plan for the future. So we're going to try and break that down into six steps, that planning process, you know, learn and quantifying those key strategic, uh, strategic initiatives. And so these are the six steps that we're going to talk about today, um, identifying the team and the stakeholders, who's involved uh, with the process. You, you, you know, the, obviously the board of your facilities of the hospitals own the governance of the, of the organization and set policy, but it's up to the, the management team to really implement the strategy. And so just making sure they're, they're involved in that process. Uh, developing a common fact base, or what I call a baseline. Here's where we're at, and we'll kind of, we'll unpack each one of these in a few minutes. And then developing some of those objectives that, uh, you know, what are the opportunities in your markets? And then determining a strategy to prioritize them how do we rank them? How do we get to, how do we decide which initiative we need to embark on or, or do now versus later? Um, and then quantifying that financial impact so we can show that cause and effect. And then, and then again, it's implementing, measuring, monitoring, and improving. We'll kind of recap that a little bit. But the strategic plan, just like the strategic financial plan, is an iterative process. It's a, it's a, it's a continuous process. It's not something you just do. You set it on the shelf and wait till next year or two years or three years from now. So before I get started here, next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Nope. OK, this thing is, there we go. So before, you know, what is a strategic finan financial plan? So let's kind of, you know, I kind of gave you a, a, a few clues already. But really, it's, oops. Okay, okay, there, all right, settle down. Um, so I stole this slide from one of my colleagues, and I think it's a pretty good one. And what is, first of all, what is your strategic plan? Well, we have a strategic plan, it's called doing things, right? And so um, I think that's pretty uh, insightful, but it's kind of the old way of doing things, so to speak, no pun intended. But really, a strategic plan, in order for you to have a, a good strategic plan, you, you need to really keep, keep it relevant and current. And these are some of the reasons why you may be timed update. I didn't see a lot of hands go up when I talked about strategic plan, but you probably have one. It's just maybe not, you know, living, working document. And most successful organizations are looking at that strategic plan. I have clients, the CEO on his desk is the strategic plan, and he looks at it, if not daily, at least weekly. They address it in their board meetings monthly. They look at it. It's a nimble. It's a... It's an ongoing process. It's almost a flexible process where they're always updating it, whether it's quarterly, six months, a year, or so forth. So some of the things that might trigger you know, an update to the plan, because you don't want to do a strategic financial plan if your plan is not relevant or updated. So these are just some, some things that you might hear or things that I might hear. Uh, the regulatory environment. For a lot of the, how many in this room are more rural hospitals versus, say, rural hospitals, rural facilities? Quite a bit. And then some of the larger ones. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether you're small or rural, or large or, or whatever, in, everything in between. You know, these principles are something that you really need to kind of look at. But from a regulatory standpoint, you know, what has changed? What's impacting those operations? 
Many of you that maybe operate rural health clinics, there's a significant change in the, in, in the limits. So in other words, hospitals with less than 50 beds no longer are, you know, as you go, go forward, you don't get your full cost. You have a limit. It might be a base year or the statutory limit if you're enrolling a, a rural health clinic going forward. But that has significant consequences to many hospitals, even larger hospitals. We're, right now, today, we're seeing a lot more larger health systems reach out to us to plan for their rural strategy. And part of that rural strategy is maybe now um, setting up or, you know, you know, setting up rural health clinics where they didn't want to in the past because they, the hospital had more than 50 beds, they were only getting $87 per encounter. Now they get 100 this year, they get 113, next year they get 126, and so on. So, so there are some strategies now that they didn't really think about, you know, two years ago that now they're thinking about a lot, which can be an opportunity and a threat from that perspective. And then, of course, the economic conditions. You know, Eric and Lisa went through that whole litany of economic conditions and so forth, so that has an impact. And then just kind of some of the other ones are really just making sure that everybody's on the same page. You know, you don't get three different answers on what's your plan, what, what's the plan, what's the strategic plan. You kind of get the, the uh, similar answers. So if they're all asking the same questions or giving you different answers, maybe it's time to either A, update your plan or maybe try to uh, make sure that everyone is aware of the plan and everyone's on the same page. So really, from that perspective, that the strategic financial plan is really just that roadmap to achieving results. We see way, you know, far too often hospitals that have strategic plans, you know, they're doing well, they think they're doing well, they, they look at their plan, but they're not really achieving the results they want because they're not really testing the initiatives that, you know, maybe they're investing money, but it's losing money. So a, a strategic plan is really an opportunity to pressure test the strategic financial plan, I should say, is really an opportunity to pressure test those initiatives. So these are just a few um, kind of the three elements of a successful plan, you know, alignment with the organization. I'm, I'm on the board of WIFLI, and, and we have some WIFLI folks in the room here and some of my colleagues, and I think they pretty much know, or at least they can recite at least half of the kind of what are the WIFLI 2025 strategic objectives. And the point of that is cascading it down all the way from the top down so that everyone has an involvement, everyone knows what's going on. And then they understand the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Then they understand why. So that's a, that's a, um, a, key, a key component of, of a successful not only strategic plan but a strategic financial plan. So, all right, so let's get into the... The, the six items that we want to talk about today. Seems like I'm always stuck on this type of page here, so let's see here. Oh, okay, identifying the team, identifying the stakeholders. Establish, establishing um, the team really is, is, a, is important to a successful plan in terms of getting stakeholder buy-in. So typically the team may be, may be uh, the you know, the CFO, the CEO, and then maybe another uh, operation, COO, maybe it's the chief medical officer too, and then maybe a couple members of the board, uh, just to kind of add that governance spin on it and so forth, because they have to have buy-in so that they can, when they go to the board meetings, everyone's, they, they, are the, they are the resource to the rest of the board. You don't have to have everybody in the room to do this financial plan. They already decided and went through the strategic planning process. So all we're trying to do is put some discipline around the investments that, we, that you may make as part of this financial plan. Um, the other thing is making sure, how are you gonna agree on what we invest in? Is it gonna be consensus or is it gonna be majority vote? That type of thing. So having that charter for the leadership group to understand uh, what types of resources to use and how we're gonna use those resources and uh, what, what is, what is the appetite of risk, and so forth. So, so these are, you know, under, another part of the, kind of the, kind of identifying or understanding is really knowing your, knowing the uh, people you're serving, the payers. Okay, they talked a lot about payers, and that, you know, in terms of having relationships with those payers. I know that sometimes can be difficult to do but having those relationships so that you understand what the reimbursement rates are back and forth. Uh, employers, you know, 
think there's another couple things up here. Pharmacies, if you're 340B programs, getting those relationships in. Schools, are you having school clinics? Um, the community groups, are you expanding services? There might be an area that's maybe la lacking in uh, service offerings in that particular community, so understanding that community um, and so forth. All right, so developing a common fact base. This is a fact base or a baseline. This is kind of an important piece of the pie as well. So one of the things you always want to do, you want to start with defining your, making sure that you know where, what your market is the patient, where are they coming from, what is your environment, the demographics, the ages, uh, the distribution of the ages in your, in your uh, service area, the volumes, understanding what your volumes are, and then understanding what you, the projected volume, volumes are, the future state. Physician provider complement is key to success, understanding what that market demand is. We see a lot of organizations that they, they may have some clinics in a community, but they're underperforming. And, but they say, hey, well, we'll just hire more, more physicians because then we'll have more patients. Well, not really because maybe it's not, maybe you need to right size type of thing. So understanding that market demand for the physician services. And then, and importantly, as part of the financial plan is really having that base year financial, uh, financial position or that statement, income statement, balance sheet, cash flows, whatever the case may be. But having that historic look and then creating a base year projection from that so that you can measure those investments when you start to quantify or the impact or look at the opportunities. So defining the market, markets are different in rural areas. The market, the market uh, you know, primary service area could be a very large area. We work in a lot of different areas. We work in rural areas, we work in urban areas as we're doing these strategic financial plans and helping helping our clients and you know some areas you know that primary service area may be 25 50 miles wide and and more of the frontier states versus in an urban area where it might be you know within a city or a suburb or even less and then and in fact um, I'm originally from the Midwest before I even came out west I was working in our healthcare practice out of Minneapolis and in the in the Midwest you know one of the areas I, I do a lot of work in is with rural and critical access hospitals. And um, it seems like in every, you know, every county in the state of Iowa has a hospital, and some have more than one. <laughs> and then there's also in, in Minnesota, there's several hospitals that are maybe 15, 20 miles apart where they, they, were, they were designated as critical, critical access hospitals through the necessary provider designation uh, program. You know? And so, so it's, Having that, looking at that service area, it's pretty hard to identify your service area when, your na when the neighboring hospital is 15, 17 miles away, another one's 20 miles away, so you have this like triangle of hospitals all within a 20 mile radius. So how do you define that? So those are some of the challenges you get. You know, but as part of that, as part of understanding your market, then you can identify, hey, is there, a, is there an opportunity to work with this hospital on a center of excellence, what we do best? Maybe we're really good at, maybe we've been successful at recruiting surgeons, but this other area has all the OB stuff going on. So it's like, maybe it's working with those leaders to try and come together. So just understanding that market is, is key as well. Okay, there we go. And then the demographics itself, understanding how many people are in the area, kind of by age and by uh, you know, age distribution, understanding the primary and the secondary service area. This is really helpful in determining what is the, the right service area or right service lines that the hospital may want to expand into or improve. Uh, this is physician need. What's your physician complement? In this, in this, we broke this down in this primary uh, service area. We broke it down by primary care, you know, sub, spe, subspecialty, and then surger, surgical subspecialties. So you can see in this particular example, we, we don't really have a shortage in the, primary service er, in the primary service area for primary care. But we do have a little bit of demand for some of the medical subspecialists, you know, the allergy, uh, uh, whatever, you know, audiology, cardiology, dermatology, maybe some of those areas. and then. But then when you really look at the surgical specialties based on the data in the market, it may be that we need a surgeon or two 
whether it's ortho or general or whatever the case may be. So making sure you understand that versus blindly going out, if that's an, if that's an area you want to expand, to just go out and recruit and not know this information will not help you. And then the market position, what's your market share? In the state of California and many other states across the country, they, in California they have the OSHPOD, which is the Office of Statewide, um, uh, statewide pu uh, Public Hospital Stuff. I can't remember what that is, but anyway. <laughs> um, uh, public Health. So basically they monitor the, the public health and so forth. And every, pretty much every state has that. This is an area, typically your CEO or your COO, if you have that, they typically have this information and are looking at market share for hospital stuff. But it's not necessarily that easy to get for clinics, for physician services. So you have to draw some comparisons or draw some, uh, do some analysis. And in this case, we, uh, this is for some clinic visits in the primary service area. The primary service area could support about 73,000 uh, patient uh, encounters in that area. And their clinic visits, when you count the clinic visits of the hospital in terms of planning, they're only seeing about 40% of that patient population. So where's the other 60% going? Is your goal to get to 60%? What, where, where are they going? So understanding that is key as well as a baseline. And then, of course, the financial, the financial state. You know, understand your current state and then create a baseline from that. So this is historical data. Uh, of the, and one of the areas that we look at from a financial is the kind of the top 10 financial indicators, uh, looking at you know operating margin, total margin, EBITDA. We typically look at it's not included in this particular slide, but liquidity. Look and make sure you have strong uh, ratios, uh, current ratio, and uh, days cash on hand. Are you collecting well? Uh, that type of thing. Looking at the capital structure, or is your long-term debt to capitalization too high, too low, it affects your credit and, and the markets if you need to borrow money to get out there and, and make some investments. Um, debt service coverage ratios, that type of thing. Average age of plant, measuring, you know, what is your, uh, how old is the facilities, not just the bricks and mortar, but how much have you invested back in the facilities it includes, you know, radiology machines, MRIs, whatever the case may be. It all kind of goes into that calculation. Okay, uh, so then, the next phase is developing the objectives and opportunities, or reviewing the, uh, the, the um, objectives and opportunities from the strategic plan. So in this, in this particular instance, you develop that list of opportunities, and these are the things that we want to look at potentially and weigh. Do we make the investment or do we wait? These should typically come from your overall strategic plan, and typically are measured in short or long-term type of of, of initiatives. So, uh, for example, you may be struggling in your revenue cycle area, and so one of your short-term goals is to improve the revenue cycle. And, we, and we're going to kind of go through a few examples here in a second. Uh, patient satisfaction may be lagging, so how are we going to turn that around? Um, and that may, and, and you know, that may be related to physician services or just hospital services, and trying to turn that around to get higher patient satisfaction scores. Um, and then just simply expansion of service offerings, whether it's physician services or hospital service line issues. You want to start an orthopedic, uh, orthopedic practice or service line or a general surgery service line or whatever the case may be, looking at those. And those typically are either short-term or long-term. But the main goal might be, it may be support of a long-term, a longer-term goal of, you know, building a new healthcare campus or maybe a new medical office building, whatever the case may be. Right now you can't, you don't have the resources to do it, but by you know, knocking off some of these short-term goals to build up operations and so forth, that'll get you to a point where you can maybe afford to, to go out to the markets or use some of your own existing uh, resources to, to uh, make some significant renovations for the facility, uh, for the hospital, or build a medical office building. I know in a lot of a lot of rural areas, whether it's rural or community areas, some of the clinics. I mean, we've we've dealt with some, some. Uh, we've been in some communities where the rural health clinics is a great program for these communities and these rural health area in these rural areas. But maybe they were stood up by just using a modular home or some kind of a looks like a trailer more or less. And so, you know, from a physician point of view or a provider 
point of view going into those communities? Would you want to go serve your patients in a basically a modular home type of thing? Well, having an ability to get to a point where you can start to build up those resources that maybe medical office building makes sense because it helps retain or recruit and retain those providers in the community to have a more um, contemporary space for them to practice. One of the things too, as you kind of look at, um, as you go through your process, you always kind of want to look at various aspects of your financial, whether it's financial, financial indicators or um, whether it's financial or it's uh, quality or other things like that. Sorry, I got to get my, I'm going to have to put my specs on here in a minute. So, um, there's, there's, uh, excuse me. So when, I, when, I, when we think about benchmarking, it's really just kind of comparing yourself against not only yourself, but against competitors to see how you're doing. And it's really a way of process improvement to, you know, everyone's a little different, but you still have to look at yourself and then look at how you're doing compared to others. And you try to get to like type organizations. So obviously you can, if you're a critical access hospital, you can look at yourself versus a PPS hospital, a larger hospital that may until has a lot more different services and you kind of look at various um, measures from that per performance metrics from that standpoint, but you always kind of want to look, at least look at yourself um, from that perspective. External benchmarks versus internal benchmarks, you know, without benchmarking, you know, internally, if without the benchmarking, you're kind of looking against yourself and without that, it's really internally focused versus understanding the competition. Um, typically, it, when you don't benchmark, you're kind of catching up versus leading or being innovative, making bold strokes to go from survival to thrive, um, those types of things. Looking at, um, you know, change, change in the, you know, when you look at yourself internally, it's kind of evolutionary. You don't know really how you're doing against, uh, you know, compared to the rest of the world or the rest of your colleagues that are your peers and so forth. So it's important to, Make sure that you're at least looking at that and understanding that. Do you guys, anyone benchmark at all in your organizations against other facilities? I mean, there's so many different benchmarks out there. One of the, uh, there is a, a benchmark to one of the good, um, there's several different types of benchmarks that I'm going to go through and actually in a second here. But looking, also looking at operations, you know, I think it was, I think it was you that mentioned about, uh, no one really cares right now about their investment policy. They're looking at operations because, you know, there's an assault on healthcare right now uh, with war on talent and all kinds of different things happening and, and the regulators coming in and trying to deny your claims and pull the money as Day was talking about. And so looking at operations is, is, is really a key and maybe in this particular instance, this particular hospital, you know, their, their operating margins have been kind of in that one to 2% total margin, the difference there is probably, you know, this is a government or a district hospital, so it has some tax levy revenue and so forth that's making up that difference. Uh, but look at 2021, what happened there? Anybody? This is a freebie. Provider relief funds and PPP loan forgiveness. So look at that. So the, the caution here is uh, really, you know, next slide is really, the caution is really looking at, okay, if there is a big spike, what made that spike? And then when you compare to benchmarks, you know, and you can see in this particular slide here, this is based on 2020 data. So the 21 data isn't out yet. So, hey, we look really good compared to the, West, the rest of the Western US, which includes um, Arizona, California, Washington, Oregon, and so forth. So we look really great. But then when you look at other, look at other opportunities or other uh, benchmarks. I, I threw this slide in just so to kind of give you an idea. The 2021 benchmark data is starting to catch up, so you're starting to see the effects of provider relief funding and the PPP loans as part of the COVID pandemic. And so I circled the areas that you look at, uh, you look at uh, 2020, Optum is a, is a uh, was formerly the Bill Cleverly benchmark report that's uh, owned by Optum now. And they have a bunch of data out. They have Excel spreadsheet, basically. It's a big database, and we can sort by critical ad, large, small, region, all kinds of different ways to slice and dice it. But you can see in 20 and 21, there's a big difference there because of that. And I'm just kind of pointing that out. 
And even and we, we also, and then there's the flex monitoring team, which is for the critical access hospitals. And this is US averages in this particular uh, slide here. And this is really just showing, you know, their data is about two years old. So this data was released in March of 20, 2022. So March of 2023, or April of 2023, is about when it comes out typically, we're gonna see the 2021 data and you're gonna see a big spike there, obviously, when you compare the two. And then we, and then WIFLI, we have our own kind of critical access hospital benchmark report where we pull data from, from the uh, HICRIS or the Medicare files, pull that data uh, based on the, on, on the cost report data that's submitted and run that information so we can kind of get the same information. And then, um, we kind of, and so you can see that there's, there's, there's other opportunities. There's another one for rural health clinics. It's through the National Association of Rural Health Clinics, just as a note. Uh, you can get that data. It kind of shows kind of the operations, operating you know, production, uh, cost per encounter, how much, how much on average is your flu vaccine, vaccines, pneumococcal, whatever the case may be. So just looking, so when you're looking at using benchmark and using data to score yourself against, just word of caution is make sure you understand what, what you're looking at. So let's just kind of diving into a few examples here as we kind of look at kind of an operation example and um, just make sure I'm on time all right. Um, you know, here's an example of this particular, uh, this particular organization is looking at their primary care clinics and they happen to be, some of them happen to be rural health clinics and the blue is the, is the actual client, and then the, the red, green, and red, green, and purple is kind of the benchmark information. So you can see that they're, they're uh, well behind, which is driving up their cost per encounter, which you say, oh, yeah, that sounds great. We're getting a high cost. But, you know, Medicare is not your only payer <laughs> um, and or Medicaid. And I guess it kind of depends on the payer mix. But... Probably in this particular example, they actually have quite a few commercial insurance plans, so they could expand. They could expand and try and figure out what's going on there. If it's is it because they don't have enough providers, or what is the issue that's driving that? And then another, so that's something to investigate and look for and understand. Another one is payer denials. They talked about a lot of denial stuff and. One of the things that this is, happens to represent um, a month of clinic, uh, uh, kind of the denial and out write-off analysis for their primary or for their clinics for the whole particular hospital, and so this is just a monthly snapshot. And if you look at if you kind of focus on the avoidable, which is where the write-off for not for timely filing or no authorizations, kind of being, being the patient advocate, as Dave was described, really enjoyed her presentation, as long as I could keep up. <laughs> so she was very quick. It was almost made me tired. So, um, but I'm just concentrating so hard. But um, so just looking at, that, if you just look at that column alone, 164, 62% of the write-offs are related to avoidable type write-offs. If you look at that, and if you assume, take that times, you know, 12 months times, say, an average collection for the primary care clinic or the, the clinics in this particular, which includes rural health clinics, is about 70%. You're looking at $1.4 million of additional revenue right there by just looking at that and trying to get a handle on that. So that might be an objective that this organization wants to look at kind of in the short term. All right. Any questions so far? I feel like I'm going pretty quick. All right. Well, I know I'm. I know I'm the last guy before the drinks, so I know. <laughs> so I'll make sure and get us get us out of here on time. Um, so how do we re refine? You know, when we think about how do we, you know, kind of determine and prioritize our initiatives. You know, we. You know, we all know that we have limited resources in healthcare, and as we mentioned before, the cost of staffing. You know when I'm going to a board meeting to present the results of, a, of their audit, I mean, obviously the, the revenue seems to be there, but the costs are so high because of either the traveling nurses or uh, just, you know, inflation. I was talking to one of, the, one of your colleagues out here today. They're ordering supplies, and the, supp the shipping costs for the supplies are greater than the actual supply itself, you know? So it's crazy, you know? Uh, so it is a crazy time right now. 
So those are things you got to look at and think about. Um, should only the financial impact matter? Not necessarily. It might be something that's mission critical. Um, and is there a way to objectively decide on these priorities? So one of the things, sorry, I told them to not put those in there, but that's okay. Whoops. All right. So um, establishing a ranking system is one way of looking at priorities. You know, let's look at the return on investment. You know, when, and this is really not a return on investment on your portfolio, but this is really looking at resources that you want to invest, to the cost of those investments to get a return to, of additional revenue streams, okay? And so looking at that, is it negative? If it's negative, probably not going to do it, or you're going to think, you're going to wait you know, hold tight and maybe think about doing it at some other time if it's, if it's really something that you want to pursue. If it's in that zero to five percent, it might be more mission critical, so you might think, okay, I'm going to get some kind of return. It may not be as much as I want, but I know that's something we need in our community, so that is one of those items that we are going to evaluate and, and uh, put on a, a little bit more priority. If it's five percent or more, then that's usually one of those items that is low-hanging fruit. So it's more of a it's it's going to have a priority of making you know having a getting to a quicker decision of yes no, you know and typically yes in that environment. So looking at the overall financial impact. So when you're doing these initiatives, you're looking at you're almost creating this little pro forma and then you're dropping it into your financial statements to understand or your kind of projected financial statements to see what what that impact is going to be. And if it's significantly positive, we want to typically move forward. Um, if it's neutral, again, depending on if it's a, a mission critical type of thing or not, or if it's negative, then maybe we hold tight or not do it at all. And this could also be for service lines that maybe we're losing money on. Um, you know, so if we're not making if we're not making a lot of money in a particular area of, of the services we offer, this might be one of those that we decide to make the you know the tough decision if it's not mission critical to exit that strategy. And so then there's also the qualitative factors that you need to also look at. Um, whoops. Again, is there a need? You know, what is, what is essential for operations? You know, what is mission critical to the organization? What's the sense of urgency? Can it wait one to two years? Or do we do it now if, it, if there's a positive return and it's going to increase our day's cash on hand and increase our bottom line? to build up some funded depreciation or whatever it is so that we could make, you know, build that medical office building or build that new hospital or significantly renovate it. Those are things you're going to probably take, you know, uh, go ahead and, and uh, start those projects and try and get them up online and going quick, quickly as possible to build up those coffers. So quantifying the financial impact, again, in this particular area, you know, when you're looking at quantifying, you want to know what your costs are. You want to know what the revenue streams are. You want to know, kind of compare that cost and benefit. Do some benchmarking. See if it looks reasonable. Ultimately, then incorporate that into your overall financial plan to pressure test that, to see what happens with that, with that uh, initiative or that investment. So in this instance, uh, we're looking at... Um, um, and, you know, expanding primary care, we obtain some cost information using external and or other internal data because we already have primary care, so we kind of know what it costs to run a, a clinic. So we want to drop a clinic in a, a neighboring community, maybe 15, 20 miles down the road. It's in a shortage area, so maybe we think about rural health clinic. Now we know because we're standing that rural health clinic up as a new one, we're not going to get that full cost per encounter, assuming this was a less than 50 bed hospital but it's still probably better than the fee schedule, okay, type of thing. Um, so we're gonna, so we're gonna look at that, we're gonna look at some benchmark data and so forth to kind of get what the, identify what we think those costs might be. MGMA is really good at, at giving you information. MGMA is Medical Group Management Association and it's basically good information for, provides a lot of staffing information, uh, support staffing information and how many ancillary type services per FTE physician, that type of thing. Whereas when you look at hospital service, it's a little bit harder to get that information when, it, when you look at operations. You can get a lot of uh, financial data for, you know, for the hospital side, but to get into operational data can tend to be a little bit more 
uh, difficult to get. And there are, there are organizations out there that provide that information, but it's very costly to get it. So did you have a question over here? No? OK. All right, sorry. Um, so, uh, so then focus on the direct cost. Look at the contribution margin. There may be some overhead costs as it relates to you know, rent or uh, you know, renting space in, a, in that community, whatever the case may be. Separate that overhead from the provider costs. You know, in this particular example, when you're looking at providers being physician services, uh, whether it's physicians or non-physician practitioners, the overhead being the support staff, you know, the receptionist, the nursing staff, the CNAs, that type of thing. Just kind of separate those two because you really need to understand that eventually, as you look at the next slide, you know, kind of focus on the, you know, look at when you're, when you look at when you're looking at items to analyze, kind of focus on the on that overhead cost. Typically, in a primary care clinic, um, you know, the provider cost, the practice overhead costs are anywhere from, you know, 60 to 70 percent of the net revenue, and and this includes typically. Uh, some ancillary services, when you look at rural health clinics, typically you're not measuring the ancillary services in those clinics because that's all being billed or being as part of the hospital services, the lab x-ray of the, of the hospital. Although you can do some allocations or identify where that referral is coming from. The other thing to kind of look at when you're looking at building, you know, the one thing that you need to also look at, because there's many times I'll go into a boardroom and they're, they're looking at, hey, we have these rural health clinics and they're losing money big time. You know, the reason they're losing money, it looks like they're losing money is because they're a rural health clinic and what's not a rural health clinic service? Lab, x-ray, any kind of technical ancillary service. Those are services that are non-RHC services and those are typically, if it's attached to a hospital, are billed out of the hospital department and so that revenue stream is not being reflected on the kind of the clinic's P&L, if you will, okay? So you kind of got to look at that downstream revenue and factor that in or at least understand that those clinics are generating significant amounts of money for the overall health system, even though the clinic might look kind of like, like it's losing money. Um, you know, estimating the revenue, looking at, you know, FTE physicians, you know, providers, I, when I say I should say providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, uh, clinical nurse specialists, whatever the case may be. Look at that market demand analysis to understand what you need. Um, again, the provider costs, in other words, the, the you know, the, the uh, physicians and the non-physician practitioners, that typically represents about 40 to 50% of the net revenue. You compare the provider costs, and, and this is a big important area to really understand the kind of the FTE of, of, a, of a provider and, and its specialty and looking at the relationship between the productivity and the cost, the compensation, the benefits, the cost that you're going to be paying the physician because typically, again, when you look at any medical practice, whether they're owned by a hospital or independent physician practice in an urban area or a rural area, they don't really have income. I mean, they build services, they pay their staff, and then they the bottom line is what they take home, right? So, so there's not a lot there, but when, so you really got to understand that, but you're not going to make, a, you're typically not going to generate a lot of return on investment from the physician or the provider services themselves. It's really the downstream and the ancillary revenue that, and the referrals, kind of quote unquote, to the, the facility is where the revenue is being generated. And then, of course, allow for ramp up time, that type of thing. And then determine how you're going to pay them. Are you going to pay them on an RVU basis? Are you going to pay them a flat salary per visit? Whatever the case may be. So then, again, you want to build this into your financial plan. So here, in this particular example, just showing the ratios, the impact on the ratios, this is after we've taken that pro forma for that primary care clinic that we're going to drop into that community. This is the um, kind of the big picture, and then we take this this document or this projected number and compare that to the baseline, which is the next one where it shows here's the here was the the result or the the net impact of of that of adding that additional service line or expanding that service line. So, for example. The projected revenue in this case here in the projection is, 
you know, they're going to generate about 830,000 of additional revenue for these physicians that they were dropping into this community. Uh, didn't really have much of an impact on the operating margin in terms of increasing or decreasing. In fact, it had a little bit of a decrease in the total margin. And the reason for that is because they lost a little bit of their mining revenue in a different state where they do a lot of mine, mining revenue, so they lost a little bit there. And then cash on hand went down a little bit because they had to use some of, they're using some of that and some of their resources to, you know, as an investment to start up the organ, to start up that additional uh, service in that community. So that's going to take some money. They didn't go out and borrow money. They just actually used internal resources to do that. And so that you can see over time, though, in year two, 20x6, 20 X6, 20 X6 <laughs> You can see that this is, again, the net change between the base year and, and the projected year. So you can see now you're starting to see increases, okay? There's some other kind of weird little dynamics going on, like in the average age of plant, it's decreasing, but that's because they're making other investments too, not only in that clinic by buying equipment, but they were making other investments along the way as kind of routine capital investments and that type of thing. Okay. We're, we're on the final stretch. All right, so uh, kind of the next step is really to implement, measure, monitor, and improve, and kind of continuously improving. So here, there are a few, you know, there's many organizations, you know, there are a few flawless implementations, as, as the slide says. I mean, we typically don't see a perfect thing, but as long as you're directionally and you're being nimble, so if, if if something's not going right, you can change it quickly. Again, looking at your strategic plan, your finance, and by the way, your strategic financial plan, when we look at it, we typically do a five-year strategic financial plan that mirrors the strategic plan. Well, that first year is really your operating budget for the next year, okay? So, and then the second year is, is a best guesstimate. It's a little bit more, you know, you can calculate a little bit more closely. By the time you get to the third, fourth, and fifth year, it's really the swag method, you know? And so it's a strategic, wild, blank guess type thing. So that's kind of the, that swag method to kind of get to that process. I mean, you have good information, so it's calculated, but at least you have something to go by. And that's why it needs to be alive, and you gotta be updating on a more annual and, and even quarterly and, and more than once a year. So, and then, Again, as I mentioned at the onset, sharing the results across the organization so they can see what, why did we make this investment? Hey, it's working for us. We're improving our bottom line. You know, we're, we're getting that much closer to maybe that new facility that we want to build or the goal of the facility. Uh, that CEO wants to leave his stamp on the community. He's been the CEO for 20 years and they want to make sure when he, le when he retires, he wants to have a nice, new, profitable hospital that's contemporary that he's really built in that community. You know, from a measurement standpoint, really looking what I would call the top 10 um, financial indicators. These are measures that I think every strategic plan should have in them. That's the you know, profitability measures, um, you know, EBITDA, operating margin, total margin. Liquidity is, you know, days cash on hand, current ratio, um, days and net revenue, that type of thing. And then capital structure, that might be your long-term debt to capitalization, which is basically how much leveraged you are. Your net assets, the uh, total, um, total assets and so forth, that, that's another kind of leverage metric that typically the higher the number, the better. Um, and then average age of plant, debt service coverage ratio, that type of thing are the other kind of four, the total the, that make up those four measures. Looking at patient satisfaction, decreasing the denials, avoid those, remember the example of the avoidable write-offs, you know, looking at that, you know, measure those things so you can kind of see that there's progress. And have a scorecard, post it somewhere, whether if it's, if it's revenue cycle related, you put it in the business office, and day where else would you put it? Business office and then the, the revenue cycle team, just to kind of see what, what's going, here's the scorecard for that, for that progress and that strategic initiative that we're making. Everyone then feels like they have a, a say and feel good about it when things are going well. Um, increasing the market share, showing that kind of graphic and so forth, quality reporting, that type of thing. Um, there we go. And then again, as I mentioned, strategic financial planning. It's not a, 
a one and done deal, whether it's a plan, the strategic plan itself or the, or the uh, strategic financial plan. You know, you, it's a continuous process. Plan for the success, that's that initiative, those initiatives, then gather the data, the cost information, the revenue information, or whatever the case may be, kind of get it going, um, put it in place, measure it, implement it, review the results. If there's changes that need to be made, make them. And remember, just that looking at benchmarks is a really good way for A, number, you know, setting targets out so you know when we've achieved our results, and then also alarms in terms of if it's a red, green, or yellow. If it's, if it's red, we need to do something now and quickly. If it's, uh, you know, if it's yellow, it's like we've got to watch it, but we, maybe we don't need to make any significant changes in, in, our, in our operations. But if it's green, things are going well, and you don't maybe worry about it. You don't put as much energy in that. So again, just that continuous process and on an annual basis, and even I would suggest even more uh, frequently as in quarterly. And you know, again, keys to success. Everyone, you know, just kind of repeating myself a little bit here. Everyone must know what the organization's vision is and goals are, cascading those down to everybody, all the way down to, you know, the the person that's you know scrubbing the floors and making them look nice and white and polished. Just making sure that everyone in the organization knows where the value is and how they're how they're contributing to a successful organization. Um, again, that gets that personal collect, uh, connection with, with, the, uh, you know, with the organization, and then making sure that they're aligned so that they can achieve the vision. And then again, you know, conclusion, just to, you know, in order to achieve a good strategic financial plan, you establish that common, that common fact base, or that baseline is what I like to call it. Identify those strategic objectives, quantify them, run them through your models, I know the investment folks here were running, they, they probably have, they have lots of models and they're running things through and it's no different than, you know, we're CPAs, right? So we like modeling, you know, and so, um, you know, financial stuff, we love Excel spreadsheets, but uh, that type of thing, just to kind of get things through and, and understand what that, what that financial impact is and then prioritize them, identify a way to prioritize those, those initiatives, whether we, make that investment now because we think there's a quick return on investment? Or do we wait? Do we wait a couple of years after maybe some of the low-hanging fruit has kind of brought us some additional resources and funding to do that? And then uh, implement and monitor, and monitor it on a continuous basis. So that is it. And it's, I got eight minutes to spare. Questions? So, oh, yes. Hi. What are you seeing with um, the reality of the fact that we have no strategic plan vision for the future with all the changes that seem to be happening as the new strategy of how you help? Okay, and let me see so if I can. Practically speaking, everything is upside down. It is. <laughs> well, that's why it's plan, really important. My perspective is there that strategic plans are less relevant for the next five years, and other is that they're more relevant. What would you say and why? Why? Well, it's a good question. I think, I think the biggest thing is, first of all, if you don't have a plan, then you're kind of like you're in the dark. You know, you really don't know what's, what the next, you know, what it's going to look like around the next corner. But if you have a plan, you can at least say, okay, well, we didn't see this coming, but now let's look at, okay, how, is, how, is, uh, how has COVID changed our environment? I mean, you know, in terms of, like in our business, you know, we have, you know, we're a CPA firm and consulting firm. We, you know, we have, we typically go into the office five days, I mean, pre-COVID, we go into the office five days a week. And now we, um, you know, we have more than, we have 3,500 associates across the firm. And about 10% of 350 of those associates are totally remote. Whereas pre-COVID it was maybe 2%, maybe one, three or 4% at best. Okay, and so looking at, you know, looking at how we do business differently, and, and for us, that's a, that's, a, that's a paradigm shift because, you know, there's different schools of thoughts on, you know, how do you learn when you're not in the office because you don't get that kind of hearing people talk about accounting issues or tax issues or whatever the case may be. So it's the same in a, 
I think in hospitals where I, I think there are several hospitals we know that actually they do work remotely now. They don't need to come into the office. So what does that space look like? Is that overhead space, can that be converted to uh, potentially to a, a, a patient service area type of space and so forth? But it's a tough question to answer. I mean, it's just there's so many unknowns right now. But the key is you need to at least understand and, and be on top of industry developments, uh, subscribe, you know, read your, you know, wish it got you know your wish it documents and all this stuff to see what's happening across the country because typically if it's not happening in your community today it will happen there eventually so hopefully i can somewhat answered your question there all right on one of your points of uh, measurement you had market share yeah and one of the things for a lot of critical access hospitals is um, they, if they measure it as within the county or within the area, often there's a big brother 30 yep. miles away or 20 miles away that still occupies a, by far a majority of your, the critical access hospitals primary market. Yep. So do you look at, on for small hospitals, do you tend to look at their overall growth percentage of, let's say it's going from 25 to 27 to 28 percent versus having more than 50 percent of it or or do you just uh, how how do you look at or do you just look at total growth of any incremental growth in market share that you want to be measuring on a for small or even highly competitive areas that uh, have three or four uh, met, uh, suburban or metropolitan sure. markets they have to look at. How do you, how do you look at that for, what re, what's regarded as positive and what's regarded as developmental from well, the I, eyes of the CPA yeah. firm? I, I think there's a couple there's a couple of kind of embedded questions in there. Number one is how do you measure what is the way to, to to feel like you're achieving results versus and then there's the other one is like. How the other kind of question is in there in, in those types of communities is how closely are you aligned with that organization? You know, the, you know, I know there's, you know, Providence is out here and and Confluence and different organizations they have, you know, and uh, Sweet Meth, you know, uh, Multi Care, various organizations in this community where they may have organizations right across the street or near and I think a lot of that is how can we work together to make sure that we're if it's possible and I know that's always not always possible and sometimes a struggle but trying to work together with them in terms of understanding what we do best so that you know if you do have a you know you have a critical access hospital in a community and you're seeing that a lot of the dis a lot of the patients are migrating out to the larger system then maybe there's some there's a plan there to provide some education to the community or maybe to work with a larger system on making sure when those patients go out i mean a simple example and this is oversimplifying it a little bit a simple example is the orthopedic work goes there but then where are they going after they have the orthopedic work are they going into their rehab center or are you sending them back to the swing bed at the critical access hospital you know, because that's a community that, you know, there's definitely studies, and I'm sure some of you probably have read them, where patients recover better when they're back in their home community and, and around family and so forth. So that's one part of the question. The original question is growth. If, you're, if your market share is 25% and you're, you're achieving, you know, 26, 27, maybe 30, and you're, you know, you're, I guess the trend line is going up, that's success, you know especially in markets where you do have a lot of competition, you know, and that type of thing. But I guess it's more about aligning and working with the organizations as much as you can. Other questions? Anyone else? Two minutes. Well. All right.